Hello, my name is Tamika Brown, and I'm the director of ECMC's The College Place, located in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm excited to share some really helpful information for students who are in grades 11th and 12th for preparing for college. What is this college going process going to be about? What is the college admissions process going to be about? What is some vocabulary that you should become familiar with? Well, I'm excited to be here to help. So in today's talk, I am going to provide information about the various options that are available for, for students after high school. Um, I'm going to talk about what research should look like for a student, who, a student who's trying to figure out what makes sense for them, what's next for them. Um, also, talk about the various academic options that are available for students in high school to get them ready for life after high school, um, the different tests and activities um, that students may want to consider as they get ready for their post-high school life, and then you know, just kind of give a snapshot for what a uh, summer, fall, and spring will look like for a student who um, is preparing for college in their senior year of high school, and then um, what to expect for decision day, and then that time soon after. So it's going to be a lot of good information. Stick with me. Take a lot of good notes, um, but let's jump in. So what are the options that are available for a student who is graduating from high school? Um, what are these options? They have their high school diploma in hand. And so what exists? So students can go directly into the world of work if they're interested. Um, they can get a job or get an internship, which in many cases are unpaid um, opportunities to learn more about a particular field of study or a field of, uh, a field of profession. Next, a student can pursue um, a college education, whether it be going to a two-year institution for associate's degree or some type of like specialized, uh, specialized vocational training program, or they can pursue a four-year education and get a bachelor's degree. Also, students can receive a certificate by uh, pursuing the, that CTE uh, pipeline, the Career and Technical Education um, Pipeline, where they're pursuing vocational and trade programming. Um, they can receive a diploma or a certification for their time there. These programs are usually short term, so anything from six weeks to 24 months. Um, but essentially, the idea is that they're getting a credential, um, some type of skilled training to go directly into the world of work. Next, students can. Um, pursue an apprenticeship, which is an opportunity for a student to get paid while they're actually being trained for a particular job. They're being uh, trained alongside journeymen, and during their apprenticeship process, they're receiving um, the actual training and being paid to be trained for the job. So when they're done their training uh, process, their period as an apprentice, they actually become a journeyman to actually be paid to do the actual job they were trained to do. So um, it's a phenomenal opportunity. But because there are not as many training opportunities through the apprenticeship pipeline, um, there tend to be tons of wait lists. So um, students, please lean into opportunities. Many of the states have registered apprentice programs uh, that students can take, in, take advantage of, particularly here in the state of Virginia. Um, so look for these opportunities because they exist and the actual career fields that they're available in is incredibly vast. Lastly, students can pursue military service or just service in general um, through community service programs like AmeriCorps. So through military service, students um, agree to uh, work, to, to commit to the armed services, um, for the U.S., um, whether it be through a, a, a reserves program, um, going in full-time service, going in as um, through ROTC program through a college or university or the, or the National Guard, uh, students can receive education benefits um, through the form of a scholarship and monthly living stipends uh, for participating, uh, for signing up for military service. Um, also, students can commit to community service or public service through an, through AmeriCorps program. Um, I've worked with quite a few students who've done uh, two years of a city year program that allowed them to work as a tutor in an elementary school program um, for a couple years in exchange for uh, an education award. And that student was able to use that to offset student debt um, or offset the opportunity to take out loans later on. So these are all the options that exist. Any, any choice that a student will make will fall into one of these two categories. I mean, one of these, uh, one of these few choices. Um, no matter what you think about it, what you envision is going to fall into these, uh, these buckets. So now that we know what the options are, now let's join into how a student should actually determine what 
box makes the most sense for them. Well, the students should start with doing some research. And so that research can come in a couple different ways. One, it can start by students exploring what's possible and what's available to them through the use of different college and career fairs. Um, these fairs exist virtually and in person, but what was great about them is that it gives students a snapshot of a lot of different options in a small period of time or in, in a confined space. So um, definitely we encourage students to lean into these opportunities. What it can really do is pique their interest to learn more about careers, to, to learn more about various colleges. So um, definitely that's a great uh, research tool. Also take advantage of campus tours. There are many opportunities for students to actually see a campus space. Now, during the pandemic, we know a lot of students lean into a lot of the virtual uh, tours. We even offered virtual tours, uh, the College Place Richmond, for students to see the schools around the state um, to really encourage them um, to uh, to go out in person. Um, we, we, we hoped our virtual tours would pique students' interest to go and see those places in person. Um, so we still make that make that recommendation go and see a school in, in person, even if it's a community college. In the state of Virginia, there are so many community college options. I want to say it's over 20. And so each school can offer different things and has a different feel of a campus. So go and visit the space to see how you envision yourself as a student there. Um, for sure, it's, it's a great opportunity to really, make, to really see how you fit into that space. Even if it's a career and technical school, there are many different options that are available. Um, figure out which one makes you feel most comfortable and be most condu conducive to your success as a student. Um, next, students can participate in job shadowing. I say once students have taken some time to kind of figure out the careers that make sense for them or careers that um, are interest to them, maybe three or five careers are of interest to them, they should spend some time actually being immersed in that career. Um, shadowing someone who's in that job, having an opportunity to spend a day in the life, uh, to see what is the average day for someone who is an architect, someone who is an accountant, someone who is a civil engineer, someone who's an astronaut. The options are endless. But the idea is that students can not only um, see on paper or through a video what a job is, but they can actually spend a day. What is the average day of someone in that particular job? And I think um, due to the access of professionals, um, through platforms, social media platforms like Instagram and LinkedIn, it's not hard for students to find uh, people who are doing their dream job. And I encourage them to reach out. The worst they can say is no. Um, so reach out and ask to learn more about their job um, and even ask for an opportunity to shadow. It could really be transformative. Next, students can take advantage of great scientific tools known as career assessments. Um, their career assessments, personality assessments, skills assessments, but what the goal is, is that these uh, assessments take in information about the student. The student inputs uh, information or answer questions about the things that they're interested in. And so these assessments collect that information and gives them feedback based on what, would, what they believe would be strong uh, matches for the student. So what will be strong career matches? What will be strong jobs for the student to consider based on their personality, based on their skill sets? Where are, what types of um, employment would the student find most satisfying by using their skill set, by utilizing the, the, um, the aspects of their, uh, their personality? So use these scientific tools really, um, because one, many of them have been spot on while identifying parts of who we are and the types of jobs that make sense for us. Um, so I tell students, use it as a launching, a launching pad, a place to start um, to figure out what jobs exist. I mean, honestly, if we just operate off what we know, we're going to only consider the jobs that we see on a regular basis. Um, we're not even going to know what's possible. Um, so I lean into these assessments because they really do give us a window to jobs who, that we didn't even know, know exist that we encounter on a regular basis. outside of the classroom. Show how they're using their time on the weekend or in the summer or over school breaks, because that time is really uh, indicative of kind of the things that the student cares about. So as they kind of craft um, a resume that lists the, the way that they spend their time, the activities they participate in, um, their day-to-day their -day tasks and activities in some cases, it can really give a school an idea of um, who the student is and the things that they prioritize. Don't underestimate the experiences that you have on a regular basis. I encounter students who say, well, I didn't have a job 
or you know I wasn't be able to act, to be active in many organizations because I had to uh, take care of my grandparent or I had to get home to get my baby brother off the bus and and take care of him until my parents got off. That shows responsibility. That shows time ma time management. That shows organizational skills. All of those things that you can describe in a resumes uh, in a resume. That's how you use your time outside of the classroom. Um, so we encourage you to please work with a professional. Um, whether it be a college or career coach at your school or a local college or career person at a nonprofit to help um, kind of tease out what are those elements about your experience that are going to be really useful um, in you creating your resume and on uh, applications and moving forward. So um, a minute ago, I mentioned using uh, campus tours to help students to really see how they fit into uh, that post-secondary space. There are plenty of options, again, for campus tours. In person is my, is my preference. I encourage students to go and see the space up close and in person to see if they can envision themselves walking around that space for four years to get a degree. Um, there are many tours available online. I would make sure, though, it's a tour that's available through the school and not through some independent um, kind of person who took a tour and, and recorded it. Those are nice, but you rather want, you want to get the information directly from the school so you can learn about the programs that exist and the various uh, uh, faculty. And you won't necessarily get insight about that from someone who's just taking a tour. Um, so I um, encourage you to use YouTube. Um, many colleges and universities have YouTube channels so that channel and, and look at various videos about the campus, different programs that the school offers. Um, and some of them go, date back to the pandemic, but at least it still gives you some insight into what's available at the school. But then beyond that, step foot on campus uh, to see the space. Moving on, other things that you should be aware of um, as you prepare for college is the different opportunities that exist in the academic realm. Um, so I want to take some time to kind of unpack some of the different types of the terminology that you may encounter to prepare students along this process. That's just to kind of give you some 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 uh, context. So first, college prep classes. There are different types of college college prep classes that exist. Um, students can take honors curriculum, AP, IB, um, dual enrollment. There are a couple different types, but it's important to find out what are the college prep courses that are available at your high school. Not all schools offer the same courses. Not all schools offer the same number of courses. Um, it really is dependent on the faculty at the school and um, the cost. Like so, what the school can afford in terms of the different types of AP classes. Um, this is a this is a little known fact. Schools can only offer as many courses as they as they have certified AP teachers to offer. Um, so I know a lot of times. Uh, parents may ask, why, why is my school offering more? Well, the school actually has to have someone on staff that is like certified in that particular AP course um, to be able to teach it. And, and, you know, that's a, it's a huge ax and a heavy lift in a lot of cases. So um, really schools can only offer what they have the faculty available to offer. Um, so college prep classes, there are many of different options. Find out from your school what's available. Something else to be aware of. Um, what are the high school graduation requirements just in general for that school? Have an awareness that that may differ from what the admissions requirements are for a college or a university. And in many cases, the higher high school graduation requirements may be the bare minimum. Even if it's a college prep curriculum that the school may be offering, it could be the bare minimum. Um, the college, though, may offer an additional, may require an additional math class or an additional science class, whereas the school may only offer, uh, like, only require two or three in order for a student to graduate. So be aware that the school, the student may meet the high school's graduation requirement, but the college itself may require something different. Um, also, specific programs at a college, again, may require uh, something that differs from what the school even requires as an admission requirement. So if a student is interested in a particular area like engineering or nursing or architecture, those particular programs at colleges may require additional coursework from high school in order for you to be considered for admission for those specific programs, not for admissions for the school, but for the specific programs that you're interested in. So find out if you're interested in something super specialized like those things I just mentioned, find out 
um, or any program, any program that you're interested in, what are the program requirements? Many of them may just be the admissions requirements for the school, but it's worth finding out. So you're not surprised uh, when you go to actually apply and find out that you may, uh, may not meet the requirements for that particular program. Also, career tech classes are awesome. Many of them, um, many of them provide students with opportunities to get credentials or certifications while they're actively in high school. So when they graduate, um, they can go directly to the world of work. Many of those programs, when a student finishes the program, they're able to pass uh, their required coursework, I mean, required tests or exams in order to get their licenses and go directly into the world of work. Not a lot of high schools offer career tech programs and, lot, and, not, and if they do, they may not offer a lot of options, but it's important to find out what they are. It could be an awesome fit for the right student. Um, but again, these programs um, go along with the high school curriculum and um, it's a form of dual enrollment, so to speak, where a student is getting their regular academic coursework and also getting workforce development training um, to go directly into the world of work. Um, Okay, so the college prep curriculum. Let's just do a breakdown of the college prep curriculum that may exist. Um, we know most high schools have a regular curriculum. That's kind of the general educational requirement from high school. Well, then um, they have college prep curriculum that the idea is that the coursework may be more challenging um, to show students um, scholastic aptitude as they consider applying to colleges. Um, or they want colleges to consider their schol scholastic aptitude as they consider admitting them into these uh, th their uh, college spaces. Um, so first, Advanced Placement, or AP, is a college prep curriculum that a school may offer. Um, it has to be taught by an AP certified teacher, um, but it's a college prep curriculum that the school offers alongside with coursework that they may already offer for the regular curriculum. AP... At the end of the AP coursework, the student can take a test, a test that they would have to uh, get a certain score on. So when you take an AP test, the score options go up to a five. Now, when students apply to college, schools, colleges determine what AP uh, courses they will accept and also what score for that AP, accept, uh, AP course that they determine to be acceptable. Um, acceptable in terms of being able to give them college credit for it at that school. So with AP, it's important to know, AP does not give the student college credit. AP gives them an opportunity to take a test to get a score that may make them eligible for college credit at the schools that they are applying to. So if students are investing a lot of time in AP courses or even dual enrollment courses, Find out from the schools that they're interested in, will those credits matter? Will they be accepted? And in what ways will they be accepted uh, to that school? Will they be applied only as an elective or will they actually work towards major coursework? Um, so these are questions that matter to students who are taking, spending a lot of time in high school taking this kind of competitive coursework um, for credit in college. Next, IB or Inter International Baccalaureate was a curriculum created um, essentially children of uh, U.S. ambassadors that were abroad. Um, the idea is that they had a, an American quality education while they were outside of the boundaries of the country. Um, and so this curriculum kind of expanded over time to now be incredibly rigorous, a college prep curriculum. Sometimes it can be paired with college credit. Um, but for the most part, IB means that they're taking a more um, rigorous coursework. It does not, though, necessarily mean that they have any college credit or um, the opportunity for college credit through AP, um, th the same way that AP does. It just means that they're taking kind of a rigorous coursework. Um, now, it could be, like I said, it could be connected to it, but by virtue of the program itself, it's a rigorous form of coursework, much like honors. Honors um, just means that students are taking more of a rigorous coursework. Uh, honors can vary from school to school, um, but the idea is that the, the coursework is more challenging than the regular coursework, but it may not have additional um, additional credit um, attached to it. It may, it may uh, have a higher weight for the school. For example, a school may have a 4.0 grading scale, but for the more uh, rigorous coursework like honors, they may uh, offer a 5.0 grading scale. I've seen some schools that for honors, they offer 5.0 and then for AP and uh, dual enrollment, they offer 5.0. 
Um, I went to college with a friend who was on an 8.0 grading scale. So it really depends on the school and how they choose to, to rate them. But um, it's just important to know what the different programs are and the weight that uh, that goes with it. Lastly, GPA, the grade point average, is what a uh, a student what will, will be reflected on their transcript to shows the show the average of their final grades of every year they attended high school, and it's called a cumulative GPA because it's, because it is the average of all of their final grades. So it won't show every grade every semester. Um, only if the, the, the student took a semester long class. So it will show the final grades for all of the coursework that the student took. Um, and then the GPA is essentially the average of those, uh, those, those particular grades uh, for that student. Students should have an awareness though what their GPA is every year. Um, there should be no surprises in terms of GPA or courses that's listed on the transcript at all. So I encourage parents and students to pull that documentation, maybe even every year, to make sure that it shows what you believe it should show. It shows the accurate grades for every year. Um, I definitely engaged with a couple parents who noticed that there was a discrepancy in the, in the transcript. And I'm sure it was not intentional, but you want the information that's leaving the school to represent you to actually be accurate. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to pull that information. So tests that a student should be aware with, or at least the test policy. Um, we know during the pandemic, a lot of student, a lot of schools shifted to being a test optional, meaning um, they determine whether or not, uh, they'll let a student determine whether or not they like to release their test scores uh, for the school to, to include as a part of their um, admissions pa package. Um, so a couple things you should know, schools who have, um, who have test optional policies, are test blind in that you can say, even if your test scores exist on your transcript, you can say that I don't want you to include that when you make a decision about me. Um, but things to be aware about. If a school is test optional and you choose not to submit your test scores, being sure that the other parts of your application are strong. If the school is not using your test scores to make uh, admissions decisions about you, they're going to lean into other parts of the application. So then they want to know, what's up with your attendance record? Why were you absent for 12 days, 10th grade? Uh, they start the political about your essay and your letters of recommendation. Um, so just make sure everything else is up to par if you're not going to submit your test scores. But every student, I believe, should uh, take these tests at least once, the ACT and the SAT at least once, give it a really good a really good solid try. Um, I don't mean you went in and you fell asleep and then you woke up and you're like, oh, that's the best I can do. No, give it a good solid try and then determine then whether or not you want to take the test again or you want to um, apply to schools uh, without submitting your scores. Sites to find out what their policies are and be sure you know the details of those policies. Now, I just told you kind of the behind the scenes in terms of the, the, uh, the fact that they lean into other parts of the application but for, for your knowledge you want to know is there um other are there additional parts that you have to submit because you're not submitting your test scores some schools may require a student to do an additional essay also by excluding your test scores does that also uh exclude you from being considered from scholarships for many schools while uh, they may have a test optional admissions policy, they don't have a test optional scholarship policy. And that's not always listed everywhere. So I would ask those questions when I engage with admissions folks at uh, my schools of interest, especially if um, I know that I'm gonna be dependent upon financial aid or some sort of scholarship funding from the school to, afford, to be able to pay tuition every year. So ask, you know, to be considered for scholarships here, do I have to submit my test scores? Ask very direct questions like that. Um, so again, take the take the test. Everyone take the test. It will not be said that Ms. Tamika uh, said, uh, I shouldn't take the test. No, everyone should take the ACT and take the SAT once. And then after they've taken the test, take a step back and determine, did you give it your all? With the scores, do you think that they reflect your academic ability? If the answer is yes, um, then the next question is, do you think with some remediation or um, additional support, um, you can have a higher score? The answer is yes, take it again. Um, and even after then, you may decide you don't want to send out to the school, but make a decision one step at a time. Don't just close the door because you are not good at taking tests or 
you don't um you don't want the stress of having to prepare for the test the test is a really strong indicator of a lot of different things but it can open so many doors so at least take the time to take it at least once the sat and the act All right, so as you build out your resume, your activities list, as some schools call them, there are a lot of things that you should include um, in this. And some students only think about certain things without thinking about others. So just to kind of reiterate this point, um, things that you should consider in for your resumes list, your activities list that you're going to need for your applications for both college and and uh, scholarships, the different clubs and organizations you participate in, um, in school and out of school, you may be active in some civic groups and some community groups that aren't affiliated with your school, but those definitely count as activities or ways you spend your time also out of school. Sports, um, yeah, students, many students are, are active in schools, uh, but they're also active in AAU teams and uh, community-based organizations. So. Um, definitely uh, participate in sports and keeping up with um, any types of uh, any types of merit awards or um, particular awards that a student may have gotten from participation in, in that particular sport is important uh, to include. Any opportunities to volunteer, um, times that you're giving your time, serving the public, um, serving um, mankind, wildlife, all of that stuff matters. And so you should definitely keep a record of um, just kind of when you're doing volunteer or community service, how many hours you're doing, because you may encounter some scholarship programs that may um, be open to students based on, uh, open to students who've done so many levels, I mean, so many hours of community service. So keep a record of that for sure. Also, again, students, some students assume that if they're not participating in clubs and activities and sports, uh, they're not volunteering at the SPCA, then they don't have anything to report, and that's not true. The way that they're spending their time outside of school matters, even if it's familial responsibilities. So um, definitely um, really spend some time just kind of outlining the different types of responsibilities and skill sets that you're building in the ways that you're spending that time outside of school. It's going to be really important. Uh, but don't miss that opportunity um, because you may not see it as, uh, as clearly as, as you may see participating in a sport. Also, if you have a job, an internship or a part-time job, that matters, that counts. So please, please, please include that information, how long you've been active, what those duties were. What were your responsibilities um, as a part of that job in your um, activities information as well? So what should, one question that I'm often asked is, you know, what should, how should I plan for, you know, preparing for college and how should we use our summer? How should we use our free time outside of school? You really should use your time outside of school for kind of three things, building new skills, gaining some experience and saving money. Building new skills because these skills can actually help you better prepare for the career of your choice. Gaining experience, because again, for the same reason, preparing you for your career of choice, um, or for transitioning into adulthood, then it also saving money because college is expensive. And um, if you have an opportunity to work and save money, the, um, that definitely uh, makes the paying for college process a lot easier. So you can get a job. Students for, start, for certain can get a job um, and save money. Um, they can also get an internship. Um, where they're uh, having the opportunity to be exposed to a career. They can network with other professionals who are in their particular uh, field of interest, and they can learn more about the job, the day-to-day -day aspects of that particular role. They can volunteer by giving their time. Um, they can gain some experience and learn about uh, different opportunities, roles, people, community. There are so many opportunities to volunteer. Um, but what's great is they actually have an opportunity to serve mankind or serve people um, in ways that are not self-serving. That's really important as we develop um, citizens who are uh, citizens of the world. Also, students can spend time building their college list. Their college list should have three categories, reach, match, and likely. And so it speaks to kind of the student's likelihood to be accepted into the school. A rich school is a school where if they compare their, their, uh, their stats, their GPA, SAT, ACT scores to the school's freshman profile, if 
their uh if their the stats that they have to offer is a little bit less than what the school has posted as like this the freshman profile then it's a reach for the uh, for the student it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be accepted it's just that there's is a reach for them to actually be accepted to the school a uh, match is as you can imagine when their their stats match up with the stats of uh students of the freshman profile and then a uh, likely means that the student stats are usually higher than what's listed as a freshman profile. So the chances of them being accepted to the school is highly likely um, because they um, they they uh, their stats are higher than what the average student admitted to the school. And it also could mean that they could be considered for some merit-based aid um, because of that reality. Um, also, spend time searching scholarships. You can never spend enough time searching for scholarships, applying for scholarships because it, paying for college is expensive. I cannot, I cannot overstate that. Paying, paying for college is incredibly expensive. Um, so opportunities to save are gonna be paramount and opportunities to pursue uh, financial aid through completing scholarship uh, applications are gonna be paramount as well. So use that free time that you have for finding scholarships to apply for and actually completing the scholarship applications. Also, summer can be used for crafting your college essay. Your college essay is going to be one of your few opportunities to talk directly to a college admissions uh, counselor, talk directly to college admissions counselors. Um, and so you really want to spend some time with this document to make sure it's your authentic voice. Like that it sounds like you, it says what you want it to say, it has the tone and the voice of you. And and that it really is, is genuine to who you are. It has the message that you want to say. And it takes time to build a document like this. This is not like a, a social media post where you just scramble down something. Like you may go back and forth, um, kind of editing it in, your, in the notes app. Um, and then you kind of post it for the world to see. No, you actually want to spend time crafting this. This may take six or seven uh, drafts um, for you to actually get it right. You want this to be fine-tuned. Um, because you want the college to consider your application seriously. So consider the aspects of the pieces of your application um, um, as seriously. So by the end of the summer, students should have a couple drafts of a couple different essays um, that they can use for college applications and, and their scholarship applications as well. Um, but these should be fine-tuned documents and not just something they've thrown together that they want to submit to folks to be considered. Lastly, students should spend a lot of time creating a schedule and a calendar, particularly that's going to map out the entire senior year. Starting October the I mean starting with August the 1st, excuse me, when college applications become available. So using this um this time over the summer allows them to get kind of a a view of what the whole school year is going to look like when they uh, will have to lean into completing college applications, completing their FAFSA, completing the CSS profile if necessary, um, completing their scholarship applications, completing senior graduation requirements, different coursework that they may have to do, different other senior responsibilities like prom and homecoming. And, and if they work too, that's something else they need to add. So they should start building out this schedule with their responsibilities in terms of college applications now or the summer before so that as they add these more these other responsibilities the bones of the of the schedule is already there in terms of their college application so everything else is being added um so they'll be aware of what's what's to come but they got to spend some time over the summer figuring out what are those deadlines what are the schools they're interested in what is my college list and then what are those deadlines um before they can actually populate their schedule with other things ECMC has some for students to help them to kind of plan um, uh, plan for this college application process. Um, so we have a great worksheet available on our website. It's also available in our opportunities books, but it's about helping students to understand how to choose the right college. So it includes a lot of different factors that may be important to students, um, popular uh, factors that uh, are important to students, but allow this worksheet allows students to rank um, these factors based on what's important to them. And then kind of using that um, this process kind of weed out what really matters to them as they choose where they want to pursue their uh, their collegiate education. So it's a great resource. It's free for anyone. So please take advantage of it um, on our website or even um, through our opportunities workbook. So 
as you plan for senior year, what should this year look like? How should it how should it be um be be organized so that you can be as effective? So I just got kind of have some high level things that you should focus on for each of these seasons um, if you are in senior year. So fall of senior year, most students starts in August, um, some as late as uh after Labor Day, but it should be finalizing that college essay that you've already started. Um, you've already had many uh many drafts of, but it should be finalizing that college essay. Also completing those college applications that you've already started over the summer, um, knowing that colleges uh, make their applications available August 1st, you're trying to get this application, these applications in as soon as possible. Also, submitting financial aid forms, getting these applications done as soon as you know, um, looking to see if your schools require you to complete a CSS profile. And if the answer is yes, getting that application done as well. Uh, we know this year is going to be a little bit different with the FAFSA being released in December as opposed to October, um, but we still want students to be prepared for that process. So have an awareness that you should be prepared to complete your financial aid forms in the fall. Um, continue with completing your scholarship applications. We understand that students may slow down in the fall a bit because their focus shifts a bit into adjusting to senior year um, and getting those high priority college um, applications out. Um, their top choice schools out uh, pretty early. So we understand that if they slow down with the scholarship applications in the fall, but they should still be considering options. And if they spent time junior year planning, um, they'll know um, when the uh, the due dates are for the, the for the scholarship programs that really matter to them. Also monitoring their email and snail mail for um, correspondence with schools and scholarship programs is gonna be really important. That's gonna be the way in which they communicate with you if they need additional information or they wanna schedule interviews with you. Um, please be sure that you monitor your communication. Most of them are not gonna text you. So you need to become familiar with checking your email, also being able to um, filter out spam in your email so you can get to um, documents that are really important, emails that are really important. Um, because this time of year is going to be, it's going to be paramount for you to be able to uh, check your email on a regular basis and be uh, timely in your responses. Uh, we have another great resource for helping students to organize their college applications. Just kind of figure out what are all the questions, what information will be necessary and help you to organize that information before you actually start populating this information on college applications. So you can check that out on our website as well and in our opportunities books. In the spring, students, we encourage you to celebrate your admissions. I always uh, celebrate when I know a kid at least gets their first admissions to school because um, it just, it, it seems like a sense of relief. Accomplishment, sure, but definitely relief because they feel like at that point, at least I know I'm going somewhere. Um, so it's always exciting. Um, when students get that first acceptance letter. So uh, celebrating their admissions to school, which also financial aid offers from the schools that they've been admitted to. A uh, reminder, students will receive financial aid offers from schools they've been both accepted, I mean, student, yeah, schools they've been both accepted to and that they listed on the school, the student's FAFSA. Um, and, um, and if it was a CSS school, they actually completed the CSS profile as well. So they've checked off those boxes. They should receive a financial aid offer from that school. Um, sometimes they come as early as mid-January, um, but most students have them in their hand long before May 1st, which is college decision day. But review these financial aid offers and how much your direct costs are for that particular school and then what the indirect costs are and are there numbers that really will reflect your experience. Um, make sure that you understand the financial aid that's being offered to you. Know that you understand the loans versus the grants and scholarships, which are free money. Um, make sure you understand what loans is given to you versus loans that actually require you to complete additional application. Um, reach out to professionals who can help you if you are confused about this. We are around. We are free of charge. We just want to make sure you have what you need to make informed decisions. Also, after you consider all the factors that matter to you, Finding the best fit for a school um, will happen in the spring. Um, 
uh, National Decision Day is usually on or about May 1st every year. And so that's when we celebrate the fact that our graduating seniors have committed to next steps. Next steps could be a job. Next steps could be the military. Next steps could be a two-year degree, a certification, a four-year degree. Whatever it is, we want them to make a decision and be intentional about how they move away from high school. Um, so we're celebrating that on Decision Day, which is on or about May 1st. Also, if students are committed to four-year schools um, and two-year residential schools, they need to make sure they pay their deposits. Um, many of those deposits are due by May 1st. That, that secures your place both at the school. And if you are living on campus, you will need to pay a residential deposit for the dorms. Um, if you have not paid a deposit and have not communicated with the school about maybe financial hardship, then the school will give up your space after May 1st because they assume that you're no longer, you're not interested in the school. So they'll give up your space for someone on the wait list. So please make sure you either pay your deposit or contact the school um, to you know, share if you're having some financial hardship, um, if you are interested in the school, but for whatever reason, you're not able to pay the deposit. I encounter so many seniors who once they get one or two acceptance letters, they kind of relax because they're like, yeah, at least I know I'm going somewhere next year. Now, while it is true that you are going somewhere next year, you actually have to graduate. You have to finish 12th grade year. And so colleges will see those final grades. Now, if you've been admitted to the school, they only want to see your final transcript to confirm that you actually graduated from high school. But please make sure that you still graduate from high school. Um, don't lose sight of the goal because you're now distracted because you're starting to see small victories along the way. Um, please stay committed. Please, please, please stay committed to the end um, because the end goal is career attainment. All right. Um, other resources that we have, we have a lot of great resources to be honest. Um, in, our, in our opportunities book and also on our website, Make Your Decision is a worksheet students can use to compare financially have received from different colleges and universities. Um, it helps them kind of tease out what information should matter to them about the schools, including their including the cost of attendance. Um, it also helps you to unpack the federal and state financial aid that a student may be offered and even including the institutional aid that a college may be offering a student. But it's a great worksheet um, to help students to kind of unpack what's being offered uh, to them and have a true understanding of what their costs uh, would be, their net costs would be at the school. That's after all the free financial aid has been applied. Um, so it's a really great tool to take advantage of it and it's free. So after the student has committed to a school, we've celebrated that they have committed to the school. Um, they've made a decision, they've paid a deposit, what's next? Well, the summer after they graduate from high school, they have to focus on preparing for transitioning into college. Even if it's a two-year school, there is some uh, there are steps the students should take to make sure that they don't fall victim to what we call summer melt, um, which is, you know, students just kind of like dropping a ball or something not happening along the way um, between the end of senior year and the beginning of uh, the fall semester that causes a student not to enroll in college for whatever reason. So we want to make sure that that's not um, our student story. So we're making sure that they know about all the steps. So you have orientation. Um, usually it gives students an opportunity to see their campus, um, get a lay of the land, understanding where the different uh, buildings are, different departments are, buildings that matter to the student, that should matter to the student, like knowing where financial aid is. Um, orientation gives you an opportunity to learn more about the grounds. Um, you also, in most cases, students will meet with their advisor to help them to choose classes to enroll in. Um, and also to register for their semester in college. Uh, students will also make sure that they've handled their business in terms of housing. They pay for their deposit if they pay their deposit if they are living on campus, um, on grounds. If they have um, a roommate, they have connected with that roommate. There are tons of roommate agreements online. I encourage them to use that to make sure they're on the same page about expectations and rules and understanding preferences. Um, it makes the road uh, living together with a stranger um, a lot easier if you if you talk about those uncomfortable things from the beginning and you can start on the you can start on common ground. Also, choosing your meal plan. Most colleges require freshmen who live on campus to have um, a meal plan uh, to make sure that you're eating. Uh, you're eating the required meals a day to keep you healthy. 
Um, so you'll handle that uh, right after college. I mean, right after um, when you also, you know, handle your deposit for housing. In most schools, they're kind of on the same form, housing and uh, the meal plan preference. Class that you want, you also choose schedule. The schedule is when you like to actually take the class. Uh, depending on the size of the school, you could be, that course could be offered every day of the week at three different times. Um, so you choose whatever times that make sense. Make sure that you also are aware of who the professor is. Um, I know sometimes uh, different courses that have multiple sections are taught by multiple different professors. So talk to some upperclassmen, get some insight uh, to find out what professors uh, may be a good fit for you and your particular learning style um, as you figure out your schedule. But choose a schedule that makes sense for you. 8 a.m. for college is not the same as 8 a.m. high school. Um, your mom is not there to wake, your parents aren't there to wake you up. Um, you also, you generally don't stay up really late um, in high school as well, not when you're at home. So create a schedule that is going to help you be successful as a student. Um, also, if you have a balance for your school bill, figure out how you're going to handle that. Um, have a plan. If you have enough financial aid, cool. If you need to take out loans, handle that before um, it's time to go to move on, on campus or to um, before classes start. Um, if you want to have a payment plan with the school, communicate with the school to do that, but just have a plan in place. The bill is not going to go away because you ignore it. It's not going to be like... Um, like one of you, like your your utility bills that like if you ignore it then you know that the, the electricity is gonna stay on you just can't ignore it for a month and it'll be fine that's not how this bill is going to work if it is not satisfied by the time that you start school in most class in, in most colleges they will drop you from your classes um and if you're moving on campus if you still have a bill that has not been rectified you won't get a key so handle this before you move, you attempt to move on campus, before you start classes, handle, have a plan for handling your college bill. Also handle any paperwork that's left. If you have any financial aid paperwork, make sure you handle that. If you've been chosen for verification, make sure you provide that information for uh, the school so they can send you a financial aid statement um, and continue in the financial aid pipeline. If you have any student loans, please make sure that you have taken loan interest counseling and signed the master promissory note. That's going to be necessary for you to be able to have your student loans released to your student account. Please don't skip these two steps and be dropped from your classes um, once the semester starts. Uh, because in the case of a couple students, they were dropped and weren't able to re-enroll in those same classes. They may have to stay in college an additional semester because they did not handle that part of the financial aid, uh, the student loan financial aid process. Um, also, many schools require students to complete some uh, medical paperwork, whether it be show documentation of medical insurance or get a physical or a shot record. Make sure whatever paperwork your school requires um, for you to enroll as a student, you satisfied all those requirements um, over the summer. Don't drop the ball. Um, also, when you move with your advisor, have some awareness of just kind of what you want to do. Your advisor is there to provide advice. I just want to be aware of that. And so they don't have a breadth of knowledge about every school, every program, every class, every course that the school offers. No, but you have to guide this. You are there to ask them for advice about your process. So go in equipped with, um, and it's in a lot of cases available online, your full course of study for your particular major, and then get their advice around particular coursework. But you guide that process um, and use them to provide you with advice. Learn more about the major that you're interested in, the minor, if there's a particular pathway or, or uh, concentration. Um, ask those questions, um, but lead that conversation, lead that talk, go and equip with what you need. And if you need support with um, figuring out how to lead that conversation, um, tap into a trusted source, reach out to us at the College Place. We just want to make sure you have um, a strong step forward. All right, so summer, what should you be spending time with uh, summer after? Well, gaining some new skills, saving some money, um, as we know, experiencing some new things. Um, a lot of students spend time traveling, um, doing some volunteer work, doing some last minute things before they commit to being a college student. Um, some students start practicing how to budget 
how to use a budget, how to track their spending and managing their money because um, in college, they're, they're, they're adults and they're expected to act as adults. So they have to save and manage their money as adults. Um, develop communication plans with your family. Um, I know as college students, it's easy to kind of get caught up in the hype of the new environment, new people, um, a new space. And you may not think as much about, you know, contacting um, folks at home. You may shoot a text, ma text message back every once in a while, um, but your family misses you and they want to touch base with you. So it could be helpful for them if you create a communication plan to say, hey, we'll talk every Wednesday night um, at seven and you commit to that, honor it. If you can't make it one day, set up another a specific time. Don't just say, I can't do it. Set up another specific time to touch base. Um, but actually create a plan so that your parents will be satisfied. I can tell you stories about my mom not being happy with me um, and my limited communication uh, with home once I started school. Um, again, make sure that you have satisfied your payment for the school. If you are doing a payment plan, that means making installments, uh, payment installments to the school. Cool. Make sure you have signed those documents. You've handled that business. And most of them require you to have at least one payment under your belt before the semester starts. So handle all your business in terms of paying your bill. Um, also handle communication with your roommate. Um, it could be helpful that you, uh, you touch base to figure out who's gonna bring what. It may not make sense to have two refrigerators, two microwaves, especially if you have a small room. Um, so touch base with um, a roommate. And again, try those roommate agreements. There are plenty online that um, actually give you something to start with. If you're like, I don't know what we can agree on. There are plenty of examples online and you can use Google uh, to find them. So as you go through this process, I think it's really important um, to get family input, to get some thought um, insight from those who engage with you on a regular basis and who know you well. And so your family income could be, input could be really helpful and help you to consider career choices. Um, if it's unpacking your self-assessment results, I know there are quite a few students who, who um, kind of sit with their results afterwards and say like, does this really reflect me? And so it could be helpful to loop in people who know you well to ask um, as well. As well. Um, career exploration, your family can, can tap into networks of people they may know or uh, may be able to help you uh, find uh, folks in careers that you're interested in so you can learn more about it um, and help you to explore pathways that make sense um, for you. Also, your family could be helpful in helping you to search colleges, help you to figure out colleges that are a good fit for you. Um, what schools are a good social fit, academic fit, financial fit? And, and, and in a lot of cases, your family is going to help you to figure out college costs, whether it be to pay for it or help you to complete your financial aid paperwork. Um, there is, uh, in very few cases, will students be able to not include their parents in this process. So um, definitely need family input um, around uh, college costs. Um, but ultimately, like, because they're your family, they're going to be a part of this process, not just your process, your life. So you want to include them in helping you to plan and what life is going to look like after high school for you. What are your career goals? What are your financial goals? Um, because having those in, in sight can really do a lot in motivating students to getting through uh, the college process. Um, so establishing those goals early on are going to be super, 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 super helpful for students. Um, we have a, a couple a couple more great tools that could be helpful for students. Um, in our opportunities books and on our web, website, we have checklists. Um, oh, I used to be asked all the time, what, what should I be doing as a freshman or a sophomore to prepare for college? Well, we have checklists for those grade levels in, um, in our opportunities books and on our website. And it's helpful for helping students to plan what their year is going to look like um, coming up. So we have one for junior year. We also have one for senior year. Now you don't have to need to go, you don't have to go down the list and check everything, but I tell students review the list and it could be some things that you're like, oh, I could do that, or oh, I've already done that, um, to really boost your confidence around your level of um uh, preparedness for this process. But please take advantage of them. They're great tools um, and can really pique your interest around uh, if you're trying to figure out ideas for what makes sense uh, for how you can prepare. So I know I gave a lot of information, but all of this information is gonna be pertinent as students begin this process. 11th graders, you this information is really high level, but, it, but the idea is that next year is going to be a heavy lift for you. So you should move through this year and planning for what next year is gonna look like. Seniors, what this means for you is that you're already behind the curve. 
So you should spend some time the next two weeks, which is, um, and you know, the first couple of weeks of school to really map out what this next year is going to look like. You can use this recording or you can even reach out to get a copy of our PDF. My email address is there. Um, but spend some time planning for sure. Um, thank you so much for your time. We are here to support in any way we can. So you can reach out to us at the College Place if ever we can be of any support to you and your work. If you have questions about any of the information presented here, by all means, reach out to us. We are here to serve and support. Um, we also have other talks um, that are coming up around uh, preparing for college. One talk where I really unpack the college admissions uh, process, understanding the di different college admissions deadlines and different aspects of the college application, understanding CTE. We have different talks on um, paying for college. Um, but really, the idea is to make information accessible and available to the public so that folks can have the information they need to make informed decisions. Um, so check out our, some of our other talks because um, the information could be useful uh, for you as well there. So again, thanks so much for your time your attention. I hope this information was helpful. You have my contact information if you'd like to reach out um, and do enjoy the rest of your day.